Oh hi, I'm the heretic. So here's a video by Noncompete. I love the name, explaining everything about collectivism that we already suspected. They can't compete in the marketplace of ideas, so they don't. You can't lose a debate if you never try. Genius, huh? Actually no, that isn't fair. Communism is compatible with voluntarism. If a bunch of commies buy a big thing of land to form their own commune amongst themselves, as long as all participants are voluntary, it's fine. Let's see if Noncompete can surprise us with his part 2 to why capitalism sucks. Why am I starting at part 2? Because part 1 is everything you've already heard before. Hit it! This is Bob. Bob makes bicycles. It's hard work putting together bicycles by hand in a dusty garage, but Bob loves the work. He loves making high quality products and selling them to folks in his community at a reasonable price. It takes about five hours for Bob to make a bicycle, and he sells each bicycle for $100. Okay, so you have a setup. So far, so good. But for brevity's sake, I'll explain the context before we get to the juicy stuff. For the record, the setup is actually pretty okay. Props for that. Anyways, Bob buys bike making parts for $50. It takes him 5 hours to make a bike, which he sells for $100. Customers buy it for that much because they value the bike more than the $50 that they could save if they bought the parts themselves and built it. Anyways, doing this, Bob can make $10 an hour if he sells a bike every time he finishes building one. He then hires Kate, who can also build a bike in 5 hours so they essentially double their productivity, ignoring the law of diminishing returns. Anyways... Bob is only paying Kate half of the value of her labor. The rest of the money, the $25 that Bob pockets for himself, is called profit. And here is where things get confusing. You see, the Marxist definition of profit is different than the definition of profit. They just completely change what the word means. The uh, true definition is that when revenue minus expense equals a surplus, you have a profit. The Marxist definition of profit is what happens when workers' wages are less than the worth of their output. This is what Marxists mean when they make judgments about how profit is immoral. They're talking about workers' pay, not revenue minus expense. This makes things awfully confusing, probably by design. Are things really so bad that Marxists can't even agree with us on what words mean? What do they call it when revenue minus expense equals a surplus anyway? What word do they use? Bob really likes profit because it means he's making more money per hour for the same amount of work. The same amount of work. Except for the double ordering of bike parts, facilities to store inventory, marketing, keeping good relations with customers, I'm sure this bike shop does repairs too, and has to deal with angry customers and depending on where you live, keeping compliance with zoning laws, business regulations, and local ordinances. Given that you hired an employee, you have labor laws and regulations you need to keep track of in addition to property, business, and income taxes. But other than all that, yeah, the same amount of work. Kate turns out to be a really great employee. She even comes up with some ideas for improving the workflow so that a bicycle can be built in half the time without sacrificing any quality. Customers are still willing to pay $100 for each bicycle, but now Bob only has to pay Kate $12.50 per bicycle instead of $25. He's essentially doubled the profit he makes on Kate's work per hour. For one thing, she learned how to rotate objects in After Effects. By now, Bob is pretty busy with marketing the business and meeting with customers, so he hires some more workers to work with Kate. He even gives Kate a raise, paying her $10 per hour to manage five workers who each make $5 per hour. First off, nobody makes profit off of other people's labor. That is a ludicrous redefinition, and I'll be exactly as pedantic as I need to be to keep you from confusing people and redefining words, asshole. Perhaps the employer-employee relationship should be clarified. People buy bicycles from Bob because, although they can build a bike themselves, they don't value the $50 they'd save to do that. You said it yourself, in this video. But why do Bob's neighbors pay $100 for a bike? They could, after all, just buy $50 worth of parts and put them together for themselves. The thing is, Bob's neighbors don't want to put together bicycles themselves. For Bob's neighbors, it's worth paying an extra $50 to not have to do all the work of putting together a bicycle. So if people will voluntarily spend more money for convenience, then why wouldn't employees? Kate doesn't have to deal with customers or buy supplies, maintain the facilities, or worry about tax or regulatory compliance. 
and that convenience is worth half of her productive worth. We know this to be true because if it weren't, then she would either not work for Bob or open her own bike shop. Now here's something else. Kate's genius allowed her to increase her salary. This is wonderful. Bob's happy because his revenue is going up, so everybody benefits. But somehow, this is evil. By all means, tell us all about how Bob doesn't reward her despite her more than doubling her own salary. Because of his employees, Bob's company is able to build bicycles 10 times faster than he was able to do on his own. Bob used to make $10 per hour building bicycles on his own, but now he's making $65 for every hour that the factory's operating. Now Bob is pulling in a lot of profit. Profit is revenue minus expense. Profit is revenue minus expense. Profit is revenue minus expense. Somehow, someone doesn't know how business works. He invests a lot of this money back into the business. He rents out a bigger factory space. Yeah, another thing. Employees don't have to worry about paying rent on facilities either. Just saying. And hires even more employees. He hires a staff to manage the business for him so he can spend more time jet skiing in Malibu. And the staff make the business even more efficient and manage to sell even more bicycles. And of course, Bob is taking his cut of profits from each new worker. Bob is accumulating wealth faster and faster and life is looking pretty great. Profit is revenue minus expense. Are we going to assume his cash flow is static? That Bob's bikes always sell? That there aren't any bad days? This is the problem with assuming value and therefore profit comes from labor alone. You can put as much labor as you want into something, but if nobody is willing to give you money for it, then its value is zero. You know that employees profit off of the employer too? After all, if the bike shop runs at a loss, then the shop still has to pay the salaries of employees. It's the employer who suffers the loss. If the employees want more of the profits, then they should be willing to suffer the losses. But, uh-oh, what's this? A big new bicycle factory has opened up in town and they have a lot of big fancy machines that produce bikes twice as fast as Bob's little factory. Things are looking pretty bad for Bob and his employees. These fancy new competitors are selling bicycles for half the price of Bob's bikes and sales plummet. Great! Competition! You know exactly what should happen. Please, tell me why this is a bad thing. They're going to have to cut costs, and the only cost they can really cut significantly is labor. So Bob does what he has to do. He lays off half of his workers. To pick up the slack, Bob takes on some investors to buy some fancy new factory machinery. Fortunately, the plan succeeds. Bob is able to lower the prices of his bicycles, sales climb back up, and the crisis is averted. Did you really need to cut workers if you could just do more by investing in the machinery? That seemed to be the sole cause of the competitor's superiority. Bob and his new partners quickly realize that they can cut their costs tremendously if they shut down the factory in America and export production to China. Now all of Bob's American factory workers are out of a job. Sorry, Kate. But now Bob is making more money than ever because he only has to pay his Chinese factory workers a fraction of what he paid his workers in America, which nets him even more profit per bicycle. Outsourcing only happens because the state drives up labor costs so high that dealing with shipping across oceans, managing overseas operations, dealing with communications, complying with foreign imports and exports, customs and regulations, and all that stuff is cheaper than just doing it all domestically. Another thing, anyone who's ever actually run a business know that just firing people sucks. A veteran worker knows how a company operates, is proficient in their tasks, and fits into the company culture. A new worker needs to be trained, won't understand company culture or shorthand, and it'll take them a while before they fully fit in. To say nothing of relationships, after all, workers can become your friends, your, your family. The only one who's trying to reduce employment to that of a soulless technocratic cost calculation is you, non-compete. But why though? Why shouldn't people be allowed to make decisions on where they work or who they work for? Never mind that the factory workers in China are suffering, working 15 hours per day and barely able to survive on their crummy wages, Bob is making hand over fist. Compared to what? If they weren't earning a wage in a factory, they'd be earning even crappier wages, wading through water buffalo poop in a rice paddy. Their crummy wages have drastically improved their lifestyles. 
Maybe if you could look past yourself and stop projecting your Western preferences onto foreigners, you'd see their lives are actually improving. Why are you so obsessed with stopping people from being able to improve their own lives? From the very beginning, Bob only paid her half of the value of her labor. She would have started her own bicycle factory, of course, but she just didn't have enough money to buy all the tools and equipment she needed, and she had a child to feed. She worked hard and hoped Bob would reward her for her good ideas. And when all was said and done, Bob fired Kate as soon as he realized he could make more money moving his operation to China. <laughs> you moron, I have Asperger's Syndrome. Your emotional appeals have no power here. I've already explained why your limited understanding of how business works either happens because of the state's meddling or not at all. I mean, for one thing, you have no freaking idea what profit means. This is the nature of capitalism. At every step of Bob's journey, he has stolen labor value from his employees and sacrificed their well-being to boost his own profits. You don't even know what profit is because you've redefined the word and insist on calling it that. This whole redefinition of profit assumes that revenue is guaranteed, that there's a customer for every bike produced. It's not. Anyone who's ever been to any shop can see for themselves the unsold inventory. But even if we assume revenue was guaranteed, non-compete would still be wrong. After all, the only way he could possibly be right about profit coming from workers is if Bob's revenue came directly from his workers. It doesn't. Revenue comes from customers who are willing to pay money for what the workers and the company produces. Labor has no intrinsic value beyond what people are willing to pay for. And no, it's not the nature of capitalism. You don't even know what profit is, so I can't expect you to know that capitalism is just exchange of private property, something that literally predates the Neanderthals. What you described wasn't capitalism. It wasn't even an economic system. It was just the functioning of a single economic firm. Nothing more, nothing less. Even so, what is your alternative? Bob isn't necessarily a bad guy. He liked his employees. He felt terrible about having to fire Kate. He didn't want to lay anyone off. But Bob's competition forced him to cut costs wherever he could, and that means driving down wages. Of course, Bob could have cut down his own profits, but he's just not willing to make that sacrifice. So without competition, Bob wouldn't have needed to lay off workers. He should just have a monopoly on bike making. I shouldn't need to explain why this is a bad thing. Alternatively, he could cut down his own profits. Now, it's unclear what this means, but that's either done by reducing revenue or increasing expenses, either one of which would have made his business less competitive and therefore put all workers out of work eventually. Great work, commies. No matter which way you go, you suck. See, as the owner of the means of production, Bob is a capitalist, and that puts him in a different class than the workers he hired. Being in a different class, Bob has different class interests than his employees. I don't know if you're aware, but people don't have class interests. The owners and managers aren't a homogenous group with like interests and incentives. If this were true, then Bob's competition wouldn't have almost put Bob out of business by investing in machines. According to Marxist class theory, by almost putting them out of business, they threatened the class interest, and that's not allowed. Wow, Marxism isn't even internally consistent. I know what you're going to say next, that the workers are also a class hive mind. A worker's class interests will always drive them to seek higher wages. Every worker wants to try to earn as much of the value of their labor as they can. Meanwhile, capitalist class interests are to seek higher profits, and that means keeping wages as low as they can get away with. Profit is revenue minus expense, again. It is true, though. Employees want to be paid as much as possible, while employers want to pay as little as possible. This is good. Now, workers value money more than their own labor, and employers value the labor more than their money. So they both have leverage over each other. Now, the Marxist theory goes that employers are overly powerful in that negotiation, but if that were true, then they should be able to get away with paying literally pennies a day to workers. No. Their interests meet in the middle, and both sides negotiate on a mutually beneficial arrangement. It can't not benefit both parties, 
otherwise the arrangement could never be made. However, some people want to impose their will and prevent them from forming these mutually beneficial relationships based on a mythology of class struggle and exploitation. Just who do you think you are, you arrogant prick? Bob and all the other capitalists in the world have to act according to these principles. If they don't, other capitalists who are more ruthless and aggressive will drive them out of business. Fortunately, we live in the real world, where revenue comes from customers who like businesses enough to give them their money voluntarily, and not where revenue is something that businesses just magically get. Ruthless businesses are businesses with terrible PR and ill will from consumers. If you don't believe me, well, tell me. Who's excited about the up-and-coming video games published by EA? Under capitalism, all of human labor is harnessed to one force, the profits of capitalists. This is wrong, and we know it's wrong because otherwise workers wouldn't need capitalists. They would never consent to participating in what would clearly be a parasitical relationship. And if you're going to appeal to the worker-die argument, then you need to tell me an economic arrangement where this isn't the case. Give me your alternative. If needing to get food is coercive, then needing air to breathe is coercive too. And fun fact, foraging for berries is work too. Prove me wrong. Nothing gets made and nothing gets done unless it benefits the capitalist class that rules over the working class. That's just the nature of capitalism. Care to explain how? Or are we just on the propaganda segment of our broadcast? Consumers drive what is produced. If consumers don't want it, businesses can't get money. And if businesses don't get money, they don't get any profit. Therefore, businesses have an incentive to produce what consumers want, not what their bosses want. Also, capitalists aren't rulers. The state rules over, oh no, you, you aren't. P please don't, no, 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 please don't say that government and capitalism are one and the same. I can only handle so much stupidity. If you're a worker, then you are a victim of capitalism just like Kate. The capitalists who own the company you work for are stealing the value of your labor and exploiting you. No matter how much they try to convince you otherwise, they really don't care about you. They can't if they want to keep lifting their profits. This is the part where they manipulate your emotions to provoke envy and hatred in you towards groups who did nothing wrong. They're doing this because they don't have any facts nor can they make any reasoned arguments that you are, in fact, being stolen from or exploited. We went over this. I have Asperger's. Your emotional appeals don't work on me, and I don't appreciate being manipulated. As soon as they figure out a way to make more money without you, you'll get cut out. You are engaged in class warfare whether you recognize it or not, and if you take the side of the capitalists, you are betraying your own interests as well as the interests of all your fellow workers. So far, you've failed to propose alternatives, so I have no need to repeat myself or otherwise continue to waste my time with this propaganda. Workers don't have a class interest. They aren't a hive mind moving with singular purpose, nor are they being exploited. But here's the thing. Your problem isn't with capitalism. Like, at all. J just hear me out. Your concern is that workers aren't being paid the full value of what they produce. Kate, in your video, was being paid half of what she produced. Capitalism is just the exchange of private property. Nowhere is being paid under what you produce recommended or implied. If Kate wants the full value of what she produces, then she can do what Bob did and start her own shop using the same investors Bob used. No, the nature of the arrangement is that Kate uses the value of the capital Bob provides for free so that her own labor is able to provide things of value in the form of things customers want to buy. There's nothing exploitative about it. It's a relationship, give and take. If you don't like it, that's fine. I'm not going to convince you the traditional firm model is the optimal organization of business. Start our workers co-op with your buddies. Share the profits and losses however you want, and keep the full value of what you produce. But here's the thing. Workers' co-ops can and do exist under capitalism. Nothing about capitalism prevents them from existing. Now, I'm not saying you have to go this way, but until you will at least consider 
putting your money where your mouth is, I can only conclude that you're just another demagogue who doesn't know how the English language works. Questions? Comments? Critique? What do you think the definition of profit is? And how much sanity do I have left? Support my content through Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.